It's a new new feature. Yeah, I've never heard of before. Happen. I haven't heard of them before. Ever. I heard it last night at a library board meeting, and I went. Uh, I'm our yeah. secretary. I was like, "What? What?" Um, so, module three is Bader. Bader is my like my, my favorite week of the semester um, because it really helps paint the framework of how you're going to right. use the data. Um, so when we're th this whole the whole goal of this module so this week you want to be able to create the framework so you want to build your own internal framework of how you're going to collect your data it can be for your project it can be for your organization it can be for a hobby it doesn't really matter we're going to make up a little hypothetical store later in our exercise um you're going to figure out how and what data you want to collect and why so that's kind of creating your strategy plan right there. You want to figure out how and why you're going to need this. Um, so let's tap into our memories. Why? Um, okay. You got Augie and Ray's and you got Wendy's. Both sell hamburgers. Are they collecting the same data? You see a head shake no from Maria. That's right. They're not collecting the same data. Because you collect the data that works for your organization, you don't care what your what your your I was gonna say opponents, but what your um, competition is doing. It's what you're doing to build your model internally. It doesn't matter what they're doing. You can use it as an example, um, but you know it. It comes down to internal resources, bandwidth. If you have the knowledge and know how to do something like that. Um, and the last piece, which is kind of tying a little bit into the final that we want to get this week is how to present your findings. If you can have the best data model in the world, but if you can't present it, forget it. It's toast. It's DOA. It's not going to make it past, uh, an executive administrator that's going to hand it off. So, um, so that's this week. Bader. Interpret the framework, selecting the data to use, um, and the pre presentation of information clearly, logically, critically, both orally and written. So we've had the, this is, let's look at it as a silver lining, okay? So we've been locked down for a year and a quarter, and we've really kind of gotten a handle on this Zoom and these virtual meetings, which means that you've actually presented you did your TED talk last month, last semester. So you presented virtually. We probably in our professional life have probably had to jump in or out of a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting, or we're working on, uh, we still have some collaborate through Blackboard, but did you use collaborate at Blackboard at all last semester? It's garbage. <laughs> um, so anyway, you want to get, you know, you get that advantage of, from a presentation standpoint that you've got that, you've got that experience under your belt. Um, and Cynthia, when you were told week one with Bridget last semester that you're going to be doing a TED talk, I'm sure you probably said no, no, um, because every one of us does that. So it's not it, but it's that same feeling like we get into the beginning of a semester and it's like we're looking straight up the mountain, like, man, I, I can't do that. I don't really feel comfortable doing that. Um, I had a student, I, I went in to watch their TED talk about a year, about a year ago, it was right around Christmas. And um, this student was so confident going into their TED talk. So like, like, yeah, I'm gonna nail this thing. I can't wait, I wanna do it publicly. I'm like, sweet. So Sandy, let me come in and sit down and I'm talking to Bridget before the class and she's telling me what the agenda is and who's gonna speak. So um, this kid just started bawling from the moment he opened up to the end of the TED talk. And I'm not talking like emotional, like, like, you know, heartfelt bawling. He just totally waked out and got nervous and started crying when oh. he mentioned a sensitive subject. Oh. So um, I'm like, maybe I should leave and make things a little bit easier. So, um, and I could hear, like, I could hear like the screech. That's how loud he was crying when oh, I was outside. Goodness. So that's the Vegas rule. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So. 
But um, so, you know, the folks that are just really confident that kind of sell it like I got this thing, that they're the ones that usually struggle the most. So if, in a program like this, if you're coming in into a data course saying, yeah, yeah, I got it, I get it. Yeah, they track my GPS when I'm driving. They track my phone when I'm in Walmart. Um, well, Sal does that, but not, <laughs> not the rest of the... Um, in another little interesting aside, I heard it on the way in as a new podcast. And so they, um, they're, they're apparently there's this guy that um, worked at a gym and, uh, and he, a uh, girl he was seeing didn't show up for work one morning. So families get all worked up and then they're trying to check and they're like, well, we can't do a missing persons, has been 48 hours. So they're doing some internal work and they're trying to ping her cell phone. And um, so they get a private investigator that has ties that, you know, can, can get information through a provider, through a, uh, uh, it's not a FOIA request, but it's uh, like a, some type of federal request that they, they, they look for this person's cell phone information. And it mirrored the person at the gym that she was supposed to be with. So they were able to look at the data of the pings from this young lady and align it with the data from the pings from this gentleman that she went missing. So that's how they ended up. So they pinged it to a Home Depot. And then, what I, do you remember what I told you guys when you walk into a, a department store and you get on their Wi-Fi? They can tell where you've been, right? They can tell where you stopped. Well, he stopped in front of the Echo electric, electric chainsaw. He stopped in front of the industrial strength, like the, not the hefty bags, but the industrial strength, like uh, contractors, trash bags. Um, and, and, I'm, and those are probably two feet away from where your hefties are and your Walmart or your Home Depot brand, whatever, but they can pinpoint exact location of where you are. So then they looked at um, pay cash. So they were able to pull POS receipts and see if, you know, what was purchased and they confirmed that those are the purchases. But anyway, all this data collection because this moron kept his cell phone on, identified exactly who he was and where he, where, you know, what he was doing. Um, and in a court, um, and I don't know if she's passed away or not, but in a court without, with only circumstantial evidence, prosecutor usually won't uh, push the case. And it was, unfortunately a body is what they need to do to prove to, for basically for them to um, prosecute. And without that, it's very rare that they will, but they ended up doing it based on the, um, the data evidence that was so strong because their phones mirrored. So he did something with her and kept the phone on him. So they had two records of where he stopped. So they basically synchronized and then they looked at the video surveillance and they could see that, well, they're both in the same location, but there's only one person standing here. So pretty interesting stuff of how they can take the closed circuit television, align it with the cell phone towers bounce where the phone is being you know, used and then track your GPS based on the location in the store. So they synthesize all that data and they come up with a picture of, okay, here's where that should be. So is as elaborate as that sounds, that's kind of the root of what we're doing here. We're just trying to figure out how to best use the data. And, uh, and in a cohort I had, last, in the last summer's cohort, I have a detective from the police department and she's, um, she really wanted to get into a stronger forensic um, side of the department. And I think she was in burglary and she wants to get into homicide or something. And data was going to be her way in which she would be more comfortable in working with these cases because they do so much through like DNA and tracing and um, scanning through like these fingerprints and data fi database files that are massive. So anyway. So is that podcast like murder mystery podcast or like data podcast? No, it was a, this podcast was I clicked on it from Bernard Marr, the author, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. but it wasn't his. It was it was it was based out of uh, England. Oh, okay. Wow. So, but I think it was it was based out of England, but it was an American case. Oh. So, but it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it was just kind of like 
they're, they're, they, what we can do with this class will blow your mind. Like mm -hmm. the things that you're going to understand and use, it's gonna make you a better consumer, but it's also gonna make you more comfortable when you need to, you're gonna know where to look when you need to find something. You know, for an internal hire, uh, for like a, an external purchase. So Bader is going to be like, again, uh, your five letter acronym that you might be sick of soon, but um, um, I have a student still trying to get in here. Hold on one second. Let me just see if I've got everybody in. Okay, sorry about that. So let's talk about um, Spotify, our discussion from last week. Some dialogue, what you guys think for a free app? They push the boundaries? So, well, I, I, I talked about it with Hannah. Like, I keep going back and forth because from a personal standpoint, like, yes, I think like, it was just like getting data for data's sake and it was sort of just like flipping almost. But I really kept struggling with the idea that like, for the free portion, like, does a business have some entitlement to more information because you're getting something from them for free. You're getting this whole host of like playlists and music and all that kind of stuff. So how can we sit here and be like, you only get my name and email when you're getting all of this stuff at your fingertips for free. And that's what kept like, I think I said it in a response to someone, that's what kept like tripping me up is like, I don't, I don't know where you draw the line because what about what we're getting for it? You know what I mean? Right. But the point that Mar was kind of dancing around was that there's a lot of pay apps that you're giving the same information to. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what's, what is fair? Because, you know, what might be fair to you might not be mm -hmm. fair to Maria versus fair to Sal. You know, we all have our different boundaries. Like, like some people just get an app and they won't even look. Right. Accept, 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 my accept, kids. just That's upload right. it. Yeah. <laughs> like my kids. So I, so I actually asked both my kids. This, I'm probably a terrible mom because I don't even know what they have. And so I was telling about the discussion. I'm like, do you have Spotify? They're like, yeah. I'm like, you do? I'm like, I'm like, are we paying for that? They're like, no, 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 we have the free one. So it's interesting what Kate said. So for my kids, now for each of their 15, and so their perspective is completely different. They're like, well, it's free. Like if they want to ask me, you know, my my, you know, if I'm a male or female, like blah, 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 they're like, that's fine. They're like, but if we're paying for it, I'm not, yeah. like they don't want to. But it was just interesting how they were so willy-nilly, like, well, it's free. Of course they can ask me for whatever. You know. Oh, I don't want to trust I, well, exactly. And yeah, so that I feel good about it. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think that my kids, right, they're downloading pot. I mean, right, there's, it's a new game comes out, they download, they delete the other one, they're whatever. Like, I don't think they're even thinking about what, what a company, there's no way my kids are reading any of those disclosures. Me either, I acknowledge until now. Now I want to read them all. I want to read everything. <laughs> it, it's still like, yeah. I mean, it's, they've, they've literally, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. There were attorneys that in a survey were asked, can you look through these? The, and they're the biggies. It was it was Amazon, uh, it was the Google, any of the Google apps like mm -hmm. Google Play. And it was one, one of the other biggies. But they said, go through these um, acknowledgement swipes and tell us you know, that they're good and that they make sense. And I, I want to say it was almost like the old Trident commercial for a five dentist, but it was, <laughs> Most of the attorneys that read through it said, I can't follow this yeah. because they, they're written in such cryptic legalese that it makes it hard that you really, you, you have a hard time contesting if mm -hmm. Spotify said, no, well, look, hey, you signed it. It's like, well, where did I sign that? Well, you know, in paragraph 17, subset C where, you know, so it is, it's very deceptive, but, um, they, they have a product they're not charging and we will pay for it with our personal information. That's what it comes down to. You just have to kind of balance what's comfortable and what's not. And some people value their data more than others do, you know? So I was curious and I don't know if, I, I feel like somebody probably on our Zoom probably did this. So I don't have Spotify, right? So is the disclosure of what they're collecting, is it, 
But if I'm paying for it, <coughs> is my acknowledgement different than the free one? Well, that's what it, it said. It wasn't. It wasn't, it was right? Yeah. That's where they push the boundaries. If these clowns would have just yeah. clarified, said, yeah, hey, we're asking for this, then we, again, we're not talking about it right now. So um, I'm going to just move this back a little bit so I can. That sort of speaks to one of the things that I was going to mention and I feel like is always important is the transparency piece. Like I know even Hannah said, well, why would they need my GPS location? And, and one of the things, and I only realized it because I actually have Pandora instead, which maybe makes me not as cool, but regardless, I have the free one because I'm not going to pay for anything. And I always get ads for Boston because my number is a 617 even though I still live in Maine now. So I'll get like ads for, you know, restaurants there or something like that. So if the GPS location meant that maybe they were targeting the ads to me based on my location, then that makes sense. But when they don't explain that and they're just like, we're pulling your location, maybe they want to pull my contacts because if I have friends who are also on Spotify, we can link playlists. Like, again, there's ways that they could have said, hey, here's why we're doing it. And you would be like, okay, well, that makes more sense than just I'm pulling all your information type of thing. You guys, I forgot to tell you, I think it make you feel better, Maria. I use all different music. I think this was Pandora. Um, never in my life have I heard of that duck website we talked about. Duck, duck, duck. Uh, yeah, add on my Pandora for it. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never heard of it, like anything. And then after class, like I was listening and I was like, I some choice words for my the technology. But it wasn't <laughs> until after you talked about it that it popped up as an ad. Isn't that weird? I know. I'm I mean, it's not anymore, but. The, uh, last week they said the uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal that the FBI has capability of listening to your devices when they're off as well. So that's creepy. You're leaving this class disturbed. <laughs> well, no, you should be informed. You sure, know? sure. You call it informed. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to say about the discussion. It, it's Mary Marianne's on. Um, so I was sort of in the, like, why do they want all this data about me? Why do they need to know, like, right, Maria, like, where I am, and I'm listening to their app, whatever. But then Mary Ann made a comment about, you know, Apple Watch and, like, tracking things, and I, I was like, well, yeah, that's right. Like, I want them to track everything about me with my Apple Watch, like, like the health side yeah. of it. So it's funny, like, I want to, I want to pick and choose who gets to have, like, right? Like, I was, like, so mad at Spotify, but then I was, like, well, Apple can have anything they want for my health. Like, it was just funny how my brain was, like, well, that's crappy and evil, but that's okay. That's a good choice. Like, But it's probably because Apple tells you, hey, if you give us your information, here's the kind of resources that we can provide you so that you can be healthier. And you're, like, yeah, that's good because you're being transparent. Yeah, I think I referenced them in, in my posts, like I because I went because we have Apple Music and I was like, well, what are, what am I agreeing to? And it was like we're taking X for this reason. So, but yeah, it was funny. It was, when I, after I read Marianne's, I was like, well, I want to pick and choose now, <laughs> like who's good and who's bad today. <laughs> so, um, if you get an opportunity, uh, this is just kind of like to validate your skepticism, but uh, select on one of your apps. Yeah, just go into one of your apps and when you're going through the agreement, um, select that you choose that they don't share your data. And um, I did it in class last semester with the MLB apps. I listened to Dodgers games on the West Coast. So I have the app on my phone so I can at 1030 at night, I can just turn it on. But so I did it in class and I'm like, I'm just going to opt out of the data sharing piece. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you it's all of a five-step process, all of a five-step process, because they do it in three waves uh, with two confirmation emails that you must send to them opting out. And this is a paid app. I pay 20 bucks a year for this app. Um, but so you, any one of the apps that we have, you, you legally have the right to opt out with sharing your data, but they just make it so easy to get in there and try to do that. So most of us are gonna be like, oh, whatever, just take it, yeah. you know? Do you still get the same content? Or you still, there was no difference the in content, okay. Everything, nothing changes, except they, they get my 20 bucks every year, but they can't share my data. So they can't share my, they can't put me to, to that, oh, let me just get somebody joining the meeting here. 
they can't connect me to like um, like Adidas or Nike, their official uniform provider of Major League Baseball. They can't they can't send my information to Nike, but I'm wearing a Nike Apple Watch, so Nike's already got it. I just did it to try to be like to get them mm -hmm. uh, to to show like how cumbersome they make it to opt out, but yet to purchase that app. If I'm leaning on my phone the wrong way, it's going to click accept. You know? <laughs> so, um, hey, Joanna, we're just talking about the discussion board from last week. Hi, how are you? I'm sorry, um, for a little bit late. I thought I was going to make it tonight to class. Then something came up. I was trying to log into the to be on time in the Zoom meeting. But it was just loading and loading and it kept saying to wait for the hostess to be you know accepted me or something like yeah, that yeah we i tried letting you in and it just kept it just timed out so yeah but you didn't miss anything i have a question because i was gonna go tonight right but then i was talking with alice and i think someone told her that we need the student id to get in the building um why i didn't show up if technically you do um I I don't know if uh, I don't want to say it very loud, but if like uh, Barney Fife outside is not gonna mm -hmm. let you in the uh, in the building because somebody came in somebody came in right before me. So there were three of us in the lobby. I think Sal, you were in right around the time I was in. There was a person in front of us that they pushed to. They had him come into the right. So. Um, I don't believe they're enforcing it right now because not everybody's had the opportunity to get their ID. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't have the chance to get one yet. But Did you show it? Oh, my ID. Okay. Yeah, see, Sal got it without showing his ID. So wow. Yeah. So and then Alice, she went a little bit earlier to school to the main building to see if she can get her um the student ID. And I guess the machine or something, it was down, they couldn't give her one. So I guess that's where she got that information from that she can get in the building or something without no ID. So where yeah. is Elise now? I'm sure is she should we check on her? Should we ping her cell phone? Oh she's she, <laughs> a good one, Maria. She, she actually emailed me uh and said that she that she quote unquote broke the machine. So um but she got called into work for something, I think across the street actually. So from where we are, but um, so she might be jumping in later. But so that I, they're not really enforcing it, and um, that I know of right now. I think on uh, July six, when we have full, we full opening again, where folks can have an opportunity to get their ID, because um, we're one of the few hybrids that's still on ground. So uh, okay. But thanks for pointing that out. Thank thanks you. For, thanks for not trying to criminalize the ID process <laughs> like Sal did. Sorry uh, about being Sorry. <laughs> fake ID. That's okay. I'll go to jail for it. Sal has a fake ID. That's right. And the Senate. Number 21. <laughs> Jack Phillips or uh, Walter Grayson. <laughs> All right. So, um, any other comments on Spotify and their kind of shady, underhanded uh, dealings that? They tried pulling over on us. I mean, the only other thing I was thinking was that obviously they had this big issue before, but they're still one of the most popular music providers or whatever you would call it, streaming platforms around. So it couldn't have really affected their reputation that much. No, it didn't. But the other thing, remember we talked about data breaches uh, last week where um, the, the money can also control the media. So the folks that really wanted to see Spotify get hung out to try in this was Apple Music. Those were the biggies. Um, because, and, and even, uh, I mean, Apple, when you wanted to download a song before, before Spotify and Pandora, you had to go through Apple. Mm -hmm. That was your thing. And you had to pay 99 cents to get a song, and then a buck 29 for a song. So, uh, and Apple was really pushing the issue with this, but they they backed off. Um, and you also want to look at the timing where they were kind of not the organization itself was in a bit of bit of a turmoil. I mean, there wasn't uh, Steve Jobs was kind of at the end of things, and uh, I think he had come back and then he was gone again. But um, 
I think Clymer was the guy in charge at the time. So they just really kind of called the, you know, called the dogs off and said, okay, let's go, you know. So I don't think they really pushed it in the media like they could have because um, at the end of the day, let's face it, like if you're 18 to 24, you know, you don't care what, what Yahoo Finance has to say about it. You just want to get this music. Like, like Hannah's kids, they're going to download whatever they want. Um, and they're not going to really look at, you know, not really going to care what's scrolling on the bottom of, you know, CNBC. So I think that might have had a, a, a little to do with it because there wasn't a ton of press on it. And, you know, Pandora was the other one that really could have, they, they, they didn't want it to be a um, kind of a mudslinging. So Pandora's platform shifted a little bit, but Pandora for, for a brief time, I don't know if anybody researched it, but they're, they were making aware, like they had a friendly, they were like not a friendlier user agreement, but they were making it very clear as to what they were doing. So, um, but Spotify did the mea culpa, we were wrong, let's move on. So, and, and like, you know, it, it, again, it, it really didn't hurt them. So, um, like none of us are going to delete Spotify from our phone right now if we had it. Right? I actually put it back on my phone. <laughs> See, Kate added it. All right, I still have that on my phone. What do you use for music? Do you have a site? No, I just use YouTube for the music. Yeah. Now yeah, a lot of people do that too, and you can actually download or upload YouTube music without having to pay for it as well. So, um, just uh, extra points right now. What do you think the spot, what do you think the, uh, you, well, I have Apple Music. So what was my, the last genre that I listened to for in Apple Music? Who wants to take a guess? 90s. I don't know. Like 90s alternative. I was going to go like classic rock. Oh, that's a good one too. Okay. Like classic rock. Yeah. 80s <laughs> rock. What was it? 80s rock, you said? 80s rock, yeah. You're getting closer. Ah, You're close. getting closer. No, I, I'll take a guess, but he's going to hate me for it. I'll say 80s rock, or since you're from Boston, you know, Mass and all that. I'll say I'll say Queens, the Queen, the, the group Queen. Oh. Oh. The, I love Queen. From the, from the early to mid 80s. <laughs> okay, early to mid 80s. Sal's got that. It oh. is not. It is not Queen. I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. Oh. Any other guesses? Are you a country fan? I'm not a country fan. I do have Johnny Cash on my iPad, though, or my iPod. Yeah, you just dated yourself. I did date myself. Which one would you date yourself? I don't know, Eric, enough to be like, I mean, I just stay on the iPod. I love Johnny Cash. He said iPod. Oh, yes, fair, fair, totally fair. I still ran with an iPod Nano because they were so small and it was easier than having my phone in my pocket. So, so there. I will get it. All right, any other guesses? Okay, terminal, it's 80s hardcore. Punk. What? Interesting. Okay. Like the Misfits and those guys? The Germs and Misfits, yeah. Sex Pistols, Dead Kennedys, yeah. Black Flag. Mm. So, um, That's how you got through the traffic jam today. <laughs> no, it was a podcast. No, that's right. That's how you get through it in the morning. <laughs> um, then I had The Police. Mm. I love The Police. Um, the uh, And... Johnny Cash Essentials, Metallica Essentials, uh, Mr. Jones, The Police, Boston, The Pretty Reckless, great band. Anybody see um, Anybody see the Jim Carrey Grinch Stole Christmas? Yeah. You ever see that movie? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Taylor Momsen, the girl that played Susie Yuhu, yeah. she's the lead singer of The Pretty oh, yeah. Reckless. I'm pretty sure she lives in Maine now, in like rural random Maine. I think you're right. I think you're right. I might have to go find her. Um, <laughs> Can you get her to come to the our presentation? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to her about coming to the class. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I would total extra points there, Marie. Total extra points. <laughs> uh, huge, pretty reckless fan. But um, so anyway, yeah. I mean, that's so they have a lot of. I mean, they definitely collect a lot of data on me. But um, 
any other any other um, questions on Spotify comments? Um, okay. Wait a minute. I think we have someone impersonating Sal. Who's I know. Who else is on iPhone? Cindy, I saw that too. I was like, Sal's right here. <laughs> maybe Elise. Her name. Well, maybe it could have been because she's usually on her computer, right? And this might just be her cell phone instead. Who is the mystery iPhone user? Show yourself. <laughs> it's got to be Elise, right? Yeah. Or, or Sal playing tricks on yeah. us. If Sal didn't have his arms crossed, I would think it was him. I would think he he was doing it behind his back. Is it you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, was it really you? Yeah, I don't have my phone. Oh, I was just like, I got my backup phone. It was a, a backup <laughs> phone. Look at Sal. Sal's got a backup phone. I love yeah, it. Is that Sal? Sal. No, it wasn't Sal. And they let us. Yeah, we scared them off, I think. <laughs> did you let them in? I, yeah, I did. Oh, it's a hacker. So, Spotify. It's part of our class project today is to identify the hacker. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the paper. Um, we had the opportunity to go back in our time machine and sit in that boardroom and look at Schultz and say, hey, listen, if you would have done this, it would have come out a little bit better. So, and uh, I'm gonna reiterate, because I don't think everybody was here when I first talked about it, but again, science-based, this is a science, a master's of science in organizational leadership. So um, you're going to need the science aspect to create that theory. So, you know, we deal in a lot of guesses of what we think, you know, so we start out with, a, a, we start out with an idea and we say, okay, well, I think that might've been the reason. And then we take the idea and we try to go out and find stuff to support that idea. And then we can back up our theory as to what we think it was um, based on what we collected. So um, we know, we're pretty sure we know that, you know, nobody had a time machine and went and sat in front of Schultz and said, hey, you're blowing it here because they probably would have done something differently, right? So. But now we have that opportunity and what we're going to do here is we're going to take the data that we find this week, the data that we collect for this assignment and it's going to be part of our, our final. Because when, if, when we get through beta, you guys will see tonight, um, we, want to, we, we, we need to know how to build that business plan and how to build that strategy. Um, so we're not sure based on market lines um, report that they they really had a great strategy. We can't really say Starbucks was, they did their homework. They, they really know what they're doing. So this is our opportunity to jump into that forum. So um, I know some of you have like, you know, kind of stressed out a little bit about it because there wasn't a lot of research done on this, but this is where you're creating your hypothesis. So this is where you put your lab coats on and become scientists and say, okay, I'm a data scientist today. This is what I would collect. And this is what I would tell Schultz and this is why. So um, what are your thoughts on this week's paper? Like what, like what we wrote? Yeah, I mean, like, what do you, what do you how'd you feel about it? And, cause you were kind of in uncharted waters mm -hmm. for the first time because you weren't going to be able to go to the case study and say, hey, here's what, here's what you didn't do. So. so one thing, and I'm only bringing this up because I saw something in the news today that I thought was a little bit topical, but I, the, the only thing that I really actually felt comfortable presenting was just about their retail store presence in malls and how foot traffic in malls was going down. And so them opening stores and having stores in malls probably wasn't effective. And I think just because of what I saw online, that was the only thing I really just felt confident in trying to kind of theorize or, um, you know, have a high hypothesis about. But I also saw today, and I don't know if anyone else saw this, that Auntie Anne's, the pretzels, I don't know, I, I used to love them when I went to malls, but it started trending because a bunch of people were like, 
if you pull your store out of malls and have a standalone Auntie Anne's, I will go, I'll go through a drive through I'll pick up pretzels all the time. And so I feel like there definitely is a lot of people who are like, I'm not going to go to a mall, but I will support your business if it's outside of a mall. So that was one of the things that I at least discussed. But Maria, so, so that is exactly what like we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to present facts that we know that were somewhat overlooked, but, and, and you make a great point about, so can you imagine now if, and Starbucks has the bandwidth to do this literally and figuratively, to go out and do a social media blast and say, should we stay in the malls? And they would have probably 5 million responses by the end of, either the end of the day or, you know, when they had enough where they could figure out, yeah, that's gonna work. We can do some market research based on, we can even, they'll take the, the responders and they'll start breaking down demos from the responders and say, okay, you know, these are, these are our customers. And the other piece that, well, I don't want, I'm not gonna write anybody's parade, but anybody else have something that ties into what Maria was saying? I, I said the same, that was one of my points. And there was also like, I found a quote of Schultz, like basically saying that like retail would meet, meet its demise and yet still went forward with this. So it was like ironic in that sense. Um, and then another point was the- like, So what, what, drove, what, drove him, what drove the purchase forward even after knowing that? Um, I, I based it, I said his gut and just mm -hmm. feeling and he wanted to do, I the other piece I said was customers and then I related like customers in relation to the retail and he never really, he just went off the fact that that Starbucks was successful and the coffee lovers mm -hmm. and espresso lovers and everything they did worked. So he would just do it again for tea without taking any account of how they, what these customers want, how they, you know, how it works with tea in that sense. And like in that, re like it wasn't a Starbucks store, it's re it was, Ivana store. So yep. it's like, so there's that, like I kind of did this customer and retail and then the combination. Cause like even the stores themselves, they said we're like shoebox size. Like you weren't really going to get tea there. So like, why would you go? And they never like asked the customers what they would want. Yep. Sorry, that's that that's, that's that another, time, so. <laughs> sorry. It, and that segues into uh, point of sale information, mm -hmm. which they were clueless on. They had a horrible point of sale program uh, compared to some of their competitors, but uh, you know, we talked about Audi and Ray's across the street that uses a cash register. That's you know, like when we had that fake kitchen when we were six years old. The same type of scanning cash register. It doesn't track anything. It just keep, opens the drawer, put the money in it. It's a calculator. So um, in Starbucks, for all the customers they had. Uh, never really kind of listened to what their baristas were saying, who were the, the, the first point of defense from their customers. So that only point of contact they really had in a store, they didn't listen to, so. Well, and even the idea that the, the Tavana stores were really more retail than they were like a Starbucks where you, yes, you can buy cups and stuff, but you're really going in for like food and drink products. Yep. And so much of the Tavana wasn't that. So how can you, like even to your point of the barista, how can you compare the two in a sense when you're not necessarily providing the same. Exactly. What was it? What so? What was it? To, what was a Starbucks purchase considered? What would you consider a Starbucks purchase? What's kind of the um, the vernacular you use when you go in and buy something? Anybody? It was a transactional process. It was no feelings. You walk in, you throw your money on the counter, they hand you your coffee. Is tea a transactional process? No. no. Did Starbucks want it to be a transactional process? No. Yeah, exactly. But Kivana, you come in, you sit down, you wait 10 minutes for the tea to brew, and you, you actually engage in conversation with the person you're there with, or you read a book, or you get on your computer, or whatever. But um, so right out of the gate, uh, some of the things that Starbucks did kind of contradicted the, the, the culture of the purchase. So, well, yeah, that was one of the things that I pointed out. Like, again, tea is known for being calming and relaxing, and that's just not it with coffee. And like I said, you know, they, they took the tea and treated it like coffee and ran with it. 
and, and it's totally different. And, you know, when Tivana used to be in West Farms mm -hmm. and like I said, the experience was totally different. It was kind of like dark in there and, wow. you know, you got the shelves of fully of different teas and, you know, you can taste it. Can you, I, I've never really been inside of a Starbucks. I've always go through the drive through Can you sample a caramel macchiato yeah, at Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. You can see it for six bucks. <laughs> yeah, so Starbucks is more fast paced than whereas tea isn't. You know, it's more chilling and relaxed than than whatever else. So that was one of the things that I, I pointed out was just like, you know, how how tea is viewed as versus how coffee is. Coffee is on the go and it's a rush and and that's it. And with the tea is totally different. Essentially it it, it would be like if you, if, if um, Longhorn Steakhouse was to, or McDonald's bought Longhorn Steakhouse, they wanted to have people just coming in to get a, get a steak to go. A quick steak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we're not talking to McRib. We're talking like, <laughs> um, so just because they both sell beef does not mean that there's a natural correlation of the two. And I really think that a lot of ego drove the decision. Yeah. And when we talk, when we get into Bader, right, you're going to see um, Bader is kind of ego proof where you have to kind of bear your soul and say, this is what I want. This is what my organization needs. And this is how I'm going to get it. And if Schultz would have done that, it, again, we're probably working on a different case study tonight. So I, we're definitely working on a different case study tonight. Um, but any other any other comments on the on the paper? This was really good. I, I mean, you guys are definitely pulling it. You know. I just was surprised. So I am a Starbucks coffee drinker. We acknowledged that last week and the week before. I, I love it. Um, I mean, I, I do drink tea. That's also my evening beverage. But I think Starbucks, like you know, they had this. They have a great social media. Like they, I mean, they're all over everything. And all they needed to do is just set. I mean, I wrote this in my paper. Just say like, come to our store. See what it, see what it's about. Like it's not the same experience. But come check it out. There's so many people who follow them on social media who would be like, all right, I'm at the mall, I'm gonna go over. Oh, Starbucks told me to do that. Like right. they had this weird opportunity to just buy into. Well, I mean, and as a Starbucks consumer, I mean, I don't remember ever knowing that they bought Tivana, like until I got to this class. I was like, oh, they they did what? Like it's so weird. I never even knew. Did you know they bought Tazo? I knew yeah. that. I do knew that. I did know that. So, and, and now, I mean, Tivana is glorified Tazo. They just yeah. have it in, you know, prepackaged in their stores, mm -hmm. so. And this was not their first adventure that they did, the gut feeling, and then we kind of failed. That's what yeah. you and I hate and everything. It's like, like eventually, well, maybe because they have so much money, they, they don't care, spend. right? They can, right? Money. And that sounds, sounds ridiculous, but they're like, well, we could just buy this company and see how it goes, and if it doesn't, okay. Well, you know, I don't know if anybody did research on, the, um, you know, there were folks that actually left the company because they disagreed with it. Um, and were, soon. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it, and it wasn't. Um, left Starbucks or Tivana or like when they merged? Starbucks. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they disagreed with the purchase. They, they didn't see it working out well. But those folks were basically said, okay, you're either with us or against us. So yeah. see ya. Um, you got to realize something too that. 99% of the country, you, you see a coffee shop at every quarter mile. So mm, yeah. you have know, tea shops. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, 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 you got to dump the donuts every every hundred yards. True. So That's good point, though. And and they build them to basically cannibalize off each other. They'll put them on opposite street corners and basically tell the uh, proprietor, you know, figure it out because they both had the money. There's a up in Enfield. I drive by, there's one in Target, there's one in the Best Buy parking lot, and then there's one in the, like, uh, it's like Marshall Shopper. Yeah, yeah, Marshall yeah. Shopper. There, I, I'm serious, I could probably, I'm not even a good golfer, but I could probably hit a golf ball past all three with one shot. I'm like, how can you literally survive? Because you have to kick in so much money for franchise fees for these, and it's, really survival of the fittest. And Starbucks knows they're gonna push product to all three and the strongest will survive. So 
they're banking on people that don't want to take a left turn coming off an exit ramp. Mm -hmm. So, and that's arrogance, but you know, it's their football, it's their field. They can do what they want. Um, Speaking of uh, Enfield, yes, I'll talk about what a couple weeks ago with Best Buy. Now, you know, and I was thinking about this class and about data strategy. As far as like the field issues go, why would they close with Best Buy where they would be dominant in that area? And they and they close out the shop. I don't get it strategy wise. Well, because if your target spending is going to have the prime language to crappy electronics, do you want to go to Best Buy for their electronics? High quality, and I think they're losing business. But it, well, so I talked to, I had talked to the regional manager for uh, Best Buy because uh, I was thinking of that, that strategy. Sorry to interrupt, but I was thinking about that strategy. Like, and it's of course, they're, they're probably selling still, and they're losing money. Like, 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 like all that. Stuff. Can you guys hear what Sal said? Like, the Best Buy at Enfield closed. So. The closest Best Buy now is either Manchester mm -hmm. um, or Holyoke, Mass, which is probably what maybe 15, 20 miles in each direction, mm -hmm. right? So, but there's still the one in West Hartford over right. in, unless they closed that one. But that one, last time I checked, that was still there. Yes, that's in uh, Blueback, right? So, yes, that's where actually I saw. So not Blueback. It's in um, across from West Farms Mall. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yep. And. Yep. Yeah. And I think there's still one on the turnpike, correct? Yeah, I think is. there's still one on the turnpike. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is definitely one there. But they, so they closed a store that they, there used to be, they essentially put a store called Media Play out of business, which was up in Enfield. <laughs> they put Circuit City out of business because um, they, they just had this massive growth model. They tried to own their buildings. They didn't lease their buildings. They tried to own them. But the problem we ran into was Amazon, Walmart. You can buy these things online now. Um, they, if you remember, Best Buy used to have a massive movie section, right? Now you get your movies mm -hmm. digitally. Um, so they were converting that space over into televisions, to home theater systems, and they had a big computer section in the back. So the, the general manager of the uh, Southern New England, so he goes up from Greenfield down into uh, the Groton area, said that it was um, T.C. Richards and Son. I don't know if you've heard of T.C. Richards and Son, which are almost like, I mean, it's almost like you're going to like the Ocean State job lot of electronic stores. Very, very little frills. It's not, there's not the same ambiance as a Best Buy, but they couldn't, they were undercutting prices with the PCs where if you walked into Best Buy and the PC was, you know, 700 bucks, you could go over to PC Richards & Son, which is probably in Enfield, probably like a quarter mile away, and they would sell it to you for 650. They don't have the same overhead. Again, they don't own their building, they lease their building, so it, it, it was a, it, to see the Best Buy and Enfield clothes stunk for me because I literally drive by it every day and it's, it's, it was where I would go to get my electronics, but um, they just couldn't compete with the online market and the undercutting of a local proprietor. So they closed that one and they're hoping their customers will either buy things online or, or travel to uh, West Hartford, Manchester or Hoyo, which are not, I honestly not a lot will. Because you, mm -hmm. you, you're not even the, the inventory system they have. They they'll show you if it's available within a 20 mile radius of the store of your zip code. Then you can expand that out. Um, they're 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 limiting that because they want to have the stores that need to sell the product. They want to kind of direct the customers there. But and and this was this general manager had been with the store for a long time, and he opened the. Um, the Enfield store, um, but it's it's unfortunate. You're seeing it. All the big boxes are eventually, you know. Look at the Sears. Sears is gone. Um, Macy's is essentially all but gone. I mean, all the major stores are closed. A lot of the penny stores. I think Penny's is bankrupt now. I'm not sure. Oh, no, they got bought out. Oh, they did. Do you know who bought them? 
So I went to the JCPenney to buy a watch and at the last round of and they said, I forgot the name of the company that bought them out, but they're revamping it. And um, and the new company's going to take over and rename it and all that, stuff, something like that. It's insane. I mean, all these, you look at these malls and they, all the anchor stores are, are going. So, but anyway, we can thank uh, Mr. Bezos and all the choices we get from Amazon for, for that. But, um, so anyway, um, any other uh, questions, comments on the paper? Looking forward to reading them. Looking forward to a good grade. <laughs> Speak for myself and my team, because it was a hard one, right? I felt like Maria was hard. <laughs> it was it was hard because you were not comfortable no. making a guess. Yeah. You have to be comfortable making a guess. Now week three, I'll be more comfortable. Okay. <laughs> So with an extra week to pay yeah. my handy dandy AIC notebook, we're going to talk about Vader. Um, anybody do their homework and go ahead and figure out what Vader is? Does anybody know what the acronym is? Yeah. I but I feel like I'm gonna forget. I tried to memorize it. I know it's business questions, analysis, data. I keep can't forget the I can't remember the I and recommendation. It's the R. Insight. Thank you. Insight. Recommendation. So I kind of think they could have done a better job with the acronym, but each independent piece of it is significant. And it's kind of like a house of cards. You can't build it without having each layer. <clears throat> so evidence-based decisions. <clears throat> Always remember that. The whole point of this course is evidence-based decisions. Like we want you to be able to make good decisions as a leader, collecting data to do that. Um, Bader is gonna give you that framework where you can essentially look at it as kind of like your personal calculator and you're just gonna plug your data, you're gonna plug a suggestion or a hypothesis into that and you're gonna punch it out. And if it makes sense, we go ahead. If it doesn't, we, tr we trash it and start over. But Bader prevents you <clears throat> from spending a ton of time and energy on it, and then realizing this won't work. <clears throat> and I don't know this for a fact, but I have a feeling that the, the folks at Starbucks at the 11th hour were probably thinking, you know, this, this, might, not, this might not make sense, uh, but I think a lot of the ego and the, you know, the opportunity to rule the hot beverage industry was sitting right there in their lap and they kind of took a chance. Not everybody has that kind of coin to throw around to take that chance, but they did, and we're talking about it. So um, we're going to do an exercise tonight. I like to do this exercise. We're going to we're going to create a little kind of a little mom and pop shop. All right. So what do we want to sell? Wine. No, I'm just kidding. Wine. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I love pizza. Maybe pizza is easier. I like both. I'll take either. <laughs> okay. Let's let's do the liquor. Yeah, oh. Liquor. All right, wine. Well, I'm going to choice. Good choice for you. Okay, we're going to sell wine. <laughs> now, it's a small company. You know, we got a 1,200 square foot, pretty basic, rectangular piece of property on Main Street. Um. You know, we can't really, um, Maria, do they have any liquor 44s up in your way? I those don't are, think so. Those are the big ones in mass now. They've been buying everything out. Um, but, you know, these big commercial liquor stores that can have importers drop your specialty wine in 24 hours, like the Barrel Room, they've got places that are popping up around here. Um, so anyway, we're not big, we're small. Okay, so we need to make every purchase count. We need to make every dollar count, right? So what would be, what would our first, what would our first question be? What's our first business question, right? What, what do we want to get out of our, we're going to build a data model, but what's that first question? What are we going to ask ourselves? What do we want to do? Our questions are linked to our goals. So what's our goal as a small liquor store? Okay. To sell. Make money. Post <laughs> customer experience or? We want to make it 
So good customer experience. Yeah, yeah. Bria, what did you say? Well, Jill, Jill had to set it too to make money to sell. Yeah. Okay, you guys are all greedy. <laughs> um, I have like a boutique you want to serve, right? So it's, it's, it's okay. So that's our niche, right? Oh, boutique. Okay. We want to be that. that <laughs> we kind of want to be the Timana before Starbucks got it of liquor stores. Not where you come in and get your free samples, okay? But where you can get, you can, um, you have the feel of, you know, you want to experience the culture. Um, maybe we want to have, uh, you know, we host tastings, um, but it's it's kind of a high end mom and pop uh, liquor store, okay? Also, you need a good catchy name for the liquor store too that stands out. Okay. Right. We need, and, and I just, where I come from, they call them packies. So we're going to call it a liquor store. I'll respect the territory. The South said we need a, I call it packies. Yeah. See, yeah, packies. Sure. So we need a good name. We need a good name for it. We need, we need something that's catchy. It's going to help us stand out. Um, our goals are going to focus on, so we want to make money. So we got to build some goals around uh, we got to build some questions around the goal of making money. We got to identify how much money we want to make. Okay, that's probably a little more specific. So we can't just say we want to make tons of money. We want to say that by the end of the first, by the end of our first fiscal year, we want to be able to average uh, a ten percent annual. We want to be able to average ten percent monthly growth. So if we make a uh, uh, thousand bucks in the first month. We want to make eleven hundred bucks in the second month. So we want to show that ten percent growth. That's our specific question that we can ask that we can incorporate into our model. Okay, so we're collecting data. Our B, our business question is: How are we going to make ten percent more each month? Okay, that's our B. Everybody got that? Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Just some some questions when you're building these. The you want to look at the the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. Okay, some basics that I want to touch on. But we're we're looking at. We're also going to come up with ways now, as we move into the A, as ways in which we can gather this um, and synthesize it to get to that 10% growth, all right? So we identified our baseline. Um, so from an analysis standpoint, right? What, what would we want? I'm trying to think of how a want, wine's a little different because if we were selling flowers, we would be cool with an eight-year-old kid walking by and stopping in the shop. And that's not cool with a liquor store. So um, let me just shift this around a little bit. So we've got, we want to look at ways in which we can get figure out how we're going to get to that 10% growth. So what do we need as an organization to increase our sales? Great social media campaigns, like young professionals. Am I off the board? Yeah. Okay. No. Am I off the board? Like increase. we need to know what our sales are. Oh, what yeah. number we're increasing? You need to know what your number is to okay. increase. You need to have a basic number. business plan to get yeah. started with them. So, did you guys hear yourself? Basic. Can you guys, I don't know if you can hear it, but. I, I think Sal is just a little bit quieter. Oh, thank you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> all the way, I'm behind Sal and they can hear me. <laughs> well, we can, we can, um, we can hear you guys pretty clear. So um, if we look at, so we're building our business plan, okay? And I'm trying to just do these audibles as we're going along. So we, we've got to develop our baseline so we know what our 10% is going to be, okay? So we, our, our questions are going to be, 
as specific as we can look at what are what are they buying from us so I, I, I'll take it a, a, a twist it just a hair all right we're going to say we're only wine so we're not going to have beer we're not going to have liquor it's just going to be only wine so we can kind of kind of massage this a little bit so what are they buying from us so we want to make sure we want to find out a way in which we can identify the the top products that are moving not the stuff that we've got to go with the feather duster and clean off you know every friday we want to look at trends. We want to look at what's selling in the industry. What wine and wine is a pretty hot commodity right now, right? So, what are ways in which we can find that information out? We can look internally, right? We can analyze points internally. We can also look at distributors. Would you look at your vendors and ask your vendors what the top 10 bottles of wine are in a market across town or yep. in another town? Okay. So we look at a vendor, we look at, we talk to sales reps. Now that's external data. Typically you have to pay for external data, um, but this is external unstructured data because we're having a conversation, we're collecting this. We're going to synthesize that. We're going to start filtering that into our beta plan, all right? So, um, we're going to look at, again, our internal POS data, and we're going to look at what's moving, what's not moving. Um, one of the things that we talked about last week, you guys remember predictive at all? Predictive analytics? Anybody remember what predictive analytics does? It predicts. It does predict. It does predict. I think the name gave that away. But yeah. It, it helps us. It helps us identify uh, items that, in this case, that could be trending, um, or it could help us get out of a predicament in which, you know, we could look at, we could look at if there was a, let's say, a massive um, forest fire in uh, Napa Valley. We know that the brands that are coming out of Napa Valley. The, it's going, they're going to, their product is going to become more of a commodity than normal because they're not going to be able to move things like they typically have. So you're going to see a fluctuation in, in possibly sales and availability. In Economics 101, supply, right? Supply and demand. So hold on, we got another guest jumping in. Sorry. Oh, it's Steven. Maybe Stephen was the iPhone before. Um, so from a supply and demand perspective, um, we might want to stay away from certain brands that are possibly, you know, West Coast distribution. So things in which we can um, kind of formulate to get that, to, to put that question together. So we want to build a question. We're going to analyze, we're going to build our analysis plan based on the question that we created. Hey, Stephen. Um, so our goal again, so Steve, just to get you up to speed real quick, we were talking about a wine store that we own, small wine store over on Main Street. Um, congratulations, your partner, you're part of the cohort. Um, and we're, we're working with Bader, the Bader framework. So, um, we've come up with our business questions. Um, and our main question right now is, how do we grow our revenue by 10% each month? So we're going to look at a baseline revenue of our first month as $1,000. So we want to have our second month be $1,100. So the question that we asked was, how do we grow that? Okay, so we identified that. Um, our analysis plan, we're going to come up with our guesses. We're going to develop a hypothesis to say if um, if there's not any natural disaster in Napa Valley, then the wine costs should maintain a similar uh, similar you know trajectory. So typically, wine sales increase in the summer in the Northeast 
Um, but if there's not a natural disaster, we can expect a similar trajectory. So that's going to help. That's, that's going to be a hypothesis that we're going to want to prove. Okay. So um, what's another thing that we can look at to help prove uh, that we are analyzing the right question? So what can we look at that's going to help us basically support or disprove our hypothesis? Could we do like a, like a customer survey? Definitely do a customer survey. That internal or external data. Internal? It is internal. We could do external too, because there's a lot of vendors out there that would sell us that information. Internal will certainly help us get the right inventory for our customers. And it might be great for the first couple of months, but it might be more difficult to continue to talk to internal customers as we're trying to grow it by 10%. So we might look at an external survey. Uh, we might look at, um, we could deal, we could do um, like a, I'll throw these terms at you. So we could look at, I'm trying to think of probably the most relevant right now, um, if we did a correlation analysis between products, again, you know, we're wine, so we're kind of high end. You really wouldn't do this if you had, if we we're looking to see if Budweiser sold more than Coors, if we had a liquor store, or if Jack Daniels was a little more uh, popular than, than Jim Blue, I mean, Jim Bean, right? I don't, I don't drink the hard stuff. Um, so a correlation analysis, that's probably something we can do. Uh, so we're gonna look at the relationship between two items and we're gonna watch their trajectory or we're gonna watch their decline. And we're gonna make an assumption on basically how those two align. So if we're watching the, the trajectory, both kind of at a, you know, say like a 30 degree angle where it's heading up, and then we see one, um, I'll throw some wine names. My wife loves um, barefoot wine. So we say barefoot starts to, it starts to drop, but we're looking at another wine company, anybody? Yeah. Have it. Okay. What were, what were they? Yeah. Is it Babbitt? Cabot, C-A-B-I-T. Okay. So Cabot is still going up while Barefoot kind of drops. So we're going to look at that correlation analysis at that particular time. We're going to try to figure out why, why is that happening? So predictive analytics could tell us one, maybe uh, barefoots, you know, again, maybe barefoots in an area of the country that's in a drought. So they might not have product as readily available as Cabot. So anyway, we create our analysis plan that's going to support us asking these questions. Right, so that's the A is the analysis plan. Um, uh, let me just see if I talk about. Well, let's jump into. I don't want to get too deep into the analysis plan because we're only going to look at the one item right now. We're gonna we're gonna elaborate on these things later, and we're gonna complete this with a SWOT analysis. So it's really gonna help add to the content that you have. Um, okay, so if we uh, collect the data now, we're gonna, we figured out what our question is, we've, we've written our hypothesis out what we want, uh, now we need to use the D to prove or disprove that. Okay, so now we're gonna figure out how we're gonna get that information, right? So let's look at Again, we have a storefront on Main Street in Hartford, and we know that we can make, based on, without looking at any data, that we made a thousand dollars profit last month, okay? So that's our baseline. So if I'm gonna grow that, 
How do I determine what my base, how do I get that information together for the, to, to show that I had that, that $1,000? And I, let me explain this cleaner because I'm not, I'm not doing a good job right now. So you've got, we made a thousand bucks last month. How do we prove to ourselves that we made a thousand dollars last month profit? Receipts. Receipts is one, because we weren't tracking them live. We weren't tracking them at, we weren't tracking them in live time. So now we're going to build kind of our, our database so we can then measure that against. So we know what, what if we had this many sales in April, we're going to need this many sales in May to get that addition 10%. So we look at our point of sale data. And our point of sale data said, okay, you had 500 customers that um, basically uh, purchased enough wine to give you a $1,000 profit. So we know 500 customers came to the door. I'm sorry, 500 customers purchased something. Um, we don't, well, we're going to say came through the door because we don't have online. This is alcohol. So 500 people came through the door. We made a thousand dollar profit. Okay. We know that now that was April. Let's go to May. What are ways in which we can look at, uh, increasing that traffic? Okay. Are we going to track or are we going to get yeah. more traffic to that store? So we can show an increase of a of of a hundred bucks. Have an event or a thousand dollars. I'm sorry. Promotions. Promotion. Promotions. Advertising. Okay. Who are we advertising to? Your everyday drinkers. The only one that advertises that. Yeah. So um, we now we want to make sure now. Okay. So. We're, we're, we're going to advertise, but again, we want to know who we're going to advertise to specifically. And that's a hard thing to do. Marketing to a specific audience is a hard thing to do. So let's look at how we're going to track the people that come in our store. Because the easiest customer to get is the customer you already have. So if we can get a, a person that comes through the door to come back, then we know that we, we're moving in the right direction. But if we're losing any of those 500 customers that came in and were treated like garbage, we know we're starting in a negative. So we're gonna, we're gonna have to get out to, let's say we have 450. So now we've got to build an extra 50 just to get to that 500 and then build more customers on top of that. So we know that the simple math here, if we have 500 customers, we made a thousand dollar profit. What was our profit per customer average? Okay. It's, I promise you there'd be no math in this class, so I'll save you the. So we know that our average customer. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. So, so we know so five hundred per people spent 20 bucks and we made a thousand. Okay. And this, seriously, guys, this is the deepest we're going to get into math. It's not, we just are trying to develop our baseline right here. So we want to figure out a way that we can now look at and identify and drill down on those 500 customers. Okay. So what's one way I can do that? What's one way I can identify who those 500 customers are? You look at the cameras. No, I'm joking. <laughs> well, you're not joking. That's an excellent point. You can't look at the cameras because what a lot of stores will do is they'll have a camera set up on the outside and they'll count the people that walk by. So you're collecting that data, the people that actually walk by your store. Then you're going to measure. So you're going to, you, you can then say very high end. Okay. Last month, 750 people walked by my store. 500 walked in. So, and if we go back to line, align that with Tivana's thinking, how many people were walking by stores in the mall? That was a lot. Yeah. Schultz apparently didn't care. So, so anyway, you're, you're spot on with your cameras, Cynthia, because we take that data and we bring it down. 
we need to figure out how many customers we're going to need to get to that 10% growth every month. So we can say, all right, so 750 people walked by our store, 500 came in. Um, and let me, let me grow it just a hair. We're gonna say 1,000 people walked by, okay? 750 came in, 500 bought, okay? So now we know that next month, we're gonna need at least, at least 1,000 people to walk by the store. So that is when we start looking at, okay, well, let's, maybe we put some signage up, maybe we put some um, incentives to stop by, maybe we have some giveaways at the front of the store. So your thousand people walk by, 750 came in, 500 bought. And if we're growing it by 10%, we know that we're gonna need to generate more traffic to the front of that store to get 800 people to walk through the door this month. And it's almost like, a, again, uh, it's kind of like an inverted pyramid because it, it, the larger you get, the more possible it becomes to sustain. So you have to build a growth model to determine, look, I'm good with 1200 people walking by my store every month to have 850 purchase. So, um, or 850 come in and have 600 purchase. So we have to build that model knowing that we can sustain it. And it gets back to, we collect the data we know we can manage. We collect the data we know that we have the infrastructure to support. We're not gonna start you know, collecting social security numbers on every person that walks through the door because there's nothing we can do with those. And it just puts us at more of a liability, whereas Amazon can do that because they have the data team that can, that can vet that information. So, um, closed circuit television, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about, is especially with like an outdoor, you know, even outside mall, is what else affects traffic that you have to look at? The stores that are near you? Neighboring stores, absolutely. Location? Yeah. Location, absolutely. For me, I think and traffic, like how yeah the traffic for me if if it's a like if i got to be sitting in traffic to get to that location i'm just not going to go um okay yeah. so let me ask you this what else remember we talked about what did what did ibm buy last year when we talked about this last week what did ibm purchase weather channel yeah weather. so how many in the class checked the weather today on their phones okay. right so I need to factor in what the weather was because that might give me some type of anomalous reading when I'm looking at my data and I realize, well, we had a week of rain. So people aren't gonna be walking and strolling down the sidewalk in the rain typically, or we had a week of, of heavy snow. So the weather factors into the, the actual purchase uh, pattern of the individuals. But if we were to look at that data set, we wouldn't know that the weather was affecting our purchase because we're not an indoor facility. So we have to look at that. We have to look at, like we talked about a little bit earlier, traffic pattern. So the Starbucks up in Enfield are all built to hang a right off the, the highway. They don't want anybody taking a left. Everything's a right off the highway if you're heading south. Um, so we have to, you know, if your location's horrible, then you're not gonna get that foot traffic um, if you have to park uh, like 10 blocks down, there's a great restaurant in Manchester I used to go to, but um, I had to park like in front of that massive church on Main Street and hike like, you know, a few hundred yards to get to the place. So I'm like, I'm not doing this in August. It's like, I'll walk into the place ringing wet. So, they, but they have great food, but I'm not gonna, you know, they have no place to park. So. Um, your location, your traffic, that's all data that you're going to start looking at. You can look at, you can get your traffic information through closed circuit television. You can get your traffic information through um, Department of Public Works. They have all the metered parking. They have all the information that you can pull to see what your, you know, what the, what the, you know, the, the foot traffic is. You ever see the tubes they have in the roads when you drive over them? 
that those are um, meters that track traffic because um, they'll propose, you know, when they're looking for different zonings, they'll tell you how much, how many vehicles drove by um, on a particular day, a particular time. So there's a lot of things that this ancillary information that's going to help us figure out how to grow this by 10%. But some of the things that just think, put, you know, put your consumer hat on and um, what's, what would, what would get you or keep you from walking through that front door? So all of that data we're gonna to collect to figure out how to get our 10% growth, okay? Are we still, everybody still, we, we good? Everybody's following along here? That wasn't a resounding yes, by yeah. the way. Yeah. 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 Um, right here. Okay, so now, now we go to insight. Now we got to figure out, okay, I collected all of this stuff. And this is where I'm going to either say I'm full of myself or yeah, this is right. So I'm either going to support my hypothesis or I'm going to say start over. It's not working. So um, I'm trying to think of a re So if I looked at, if I looked at, Say, I think we talked about it last week. You know the chimes, the bells that go off when you walk through the store? Yeah. So if we look at sensor data, we could then, we could put a little chime in front of our liquor store, I'm sorry, our wine store. And, and then we could, have, we could have an actual count. So we can reconcile that count with our cash register. So um, not necessarily for a 10% growth, but what else can we find out from our foot traffic um, to our purchase? What are some of the things that we can identify through analyzing that data? How long they stay in the store. How long they stay in the store, right? So you might have the browsers or you might have folks go right to that bottle of Cabot and they're out. Um, what else can we tell about that? Would you be able to track the time of day that people come in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because your time, you're going to have a timestamp purchase okay. for those 500 uh, people that bought, and you can have. How how else can we verify time in the store? What other data can we look at? If you uh, have some type of phone number and say, "Hey, what's your number?" I can get you the phone, like going back to the promotion thing and do like a phone number kind of thing. And go, "Hey, I'll just send an email for a special on." Or okay, it, exactly right. So it sounds like you, we asked them for some information, like their phone number, their email address. Who does that? Um, who does that right now? Name a retailer that you went to in the past couple of weeks that does that. Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. Every time you're at the register, hey, you member of the Barnes and Noble Club, um, Dunkin' Donuts. You go in there and you want they want you to use your Dunkin' card because then they can tell that you were there. They don't want they don't want you to go in there incognito. They want you to go in and they can say, "Oh, hey, you're back," and then they're they're going to be able to say they're going to send me an email when I don't come back on the normal Tuesday morning, and they're going to say, "Hey, how about try this for free the next time you're in?" So they can incentivize my return. Or if we do that at the the wine store, we can then say, "Look, we'll let you know of promotions that are coming up. We know that you're a big fan of Cabot wine. We'll let you know when um, you know the next." Um, what's the what's the wine term? Well, the next bash? No, what would it be? Vintage. Next vintage is up. <laughs> That's my ignorance sh shining out right there. So I'm not sure Cabot's fancy enough for a vintage, but I see where you're going with it. <laughs> We're a bougie. We're a bougie wine store. <laughs> um, so now we're going to use that insight to again to prove or disprove. So I'm going to look at my closed circuit television. I'm going to say, yep, we had 500 people walk through the door. I can see from the cash register the average time of day they purchase. Okay. What's that going to help me with? Staff. Staffing, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe hours of operation. So do, do I have to sell more wine to make that 10%? Not necessarily at all. I run more efficiently. If I'm running more efficiently and I'm not paying the, the, the payroll that I have to pay, 
um, I'm, I'm able to recoup some of that money without having the same number of customers walk through the door if I'm running a leaner operation. So the, the insight really is the gut check where we really call ourselves out and say, okay, you collected this and this and this to prove this question. Um, and this is one thing. We can do a whole, we can do another, um, we can do beta for every aspect of the collection process and drill down in each case to learn to be a more efficient model. So, um, so again, insight is really the part where we tell us, we, we tell ourselves we're either full of baloney or we're right on and then we move to the next piece. So again, we can also tell when we're looking at that data, we're looking at the closed circuit television, we can tell the people that walk by, the people that come in, how long they're in there, who's working, who's helping them. You know, we might be able to see that there's only one person that seems to be helping these, these individuals. Not the, not the clown that thinks, you know, all wine comes in a box like, like me, but um, <laughs> it's the real people that are helping. So that's gonna help us from a staffing perspective. We're also gonna be able to look at uh, our inventory because of the 500 people that are coming in, what are they buying? So maybe we start streamlining our inventory and start focusing on more, on more products that are moving. So our, our inventory cost goes down. If our inventory cost goes down, that helps our bottom line, right? So, so it's not necessarily just sell, sell, sell. You look at the data to create your optimal model of how you're going to be a more efficient operation to get to that 10%. So it's not strictly the sell more wine, make 10%. But Good. would it also help us like with inventory? Because I think for me, the, the worst thing that goes for me, like when I go to, you know, my favorite liquor store is that, you know, there's, there they don't have inv any inventory and it's always like, oh, we're getting a truck on, on Thursday. But if you know, like, if you're looking at that data and paying attention to that data, that, like you said, this item is always selling out and everybody's buying more of this item on a Wednesday, why am I ordering it to where it's not coming in until after the peak buying time for that particular item. Absolutely right, Cynthia. And what kind of to the point that Sal brought up too. So if you're one of my loyal customers, I can tell you, hey, Cynthia, this will be here. I can send you a text when this arrives and it will have these automated text messages that go out when it's a specific product that the consumer prefers. You know, you get on that preferred list and then you'll get the notification that your, your wine is here. And I, I'm, I'm serious, I'm, again, I'm not a wine guy, my wife is totally into it, but um, we drove around one Saturday and I'm telling you, I probably hit, I, I'm not kidding you, I hit at least 10 package stores, right? She's looking for this one, I think it might've been Cavi too, because we had it at a wedding and, and um, they don't sell it around here anymore, so we just drove around looking and left our number if you, you know if you get it in and i'm like there's got to be a better way it was so you know you need a local liquor store that, that gets it for you yeah they say right. it. yeah but i don't even yeah. need the distributor you know text me so it's it's really it, it's it's again if you if you have that if you have a good handle mm -hmm. we talked about it i think our first night is that you need to be in your customers' heads. So you need to know what they want before they know they want it. And yeah. if you build a really good, strong data model where you're collecting what you need to collect, forget about all the ancillary stuff that we're never gonna use. We care less about social security numbers. We could care less about average income because we know that somebody making, you know, the minimum wage, which is, you know what, 15 bucks now? Is it 15 now? 12. 12. McDonald's is going to go to 15, right? Is that the one? So, um, but if, you know, if they're just making minimum wage to get by, um, that's still, they will find the money to purchase wine. Um, I just like, <laughs> my, my sister and I like a bit of an expensive wine. Mm -hmm. and we had a like come to Jesus conversation over the summer where I'm like, I work in non like neither of us are making a ton of money. Yep. Like we need to lower our wine mm -hmm. standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't stopped. So yes, you're right. So what would an expensive bottle of wine be? 
just like a casual expense, like, I, like Friday night oh. fire pit on lawn. Oh. I I have the price of the one I, the one I like. If I get it on sale, is like. 16 or 17, but it's like 22, 25. I think yeah. what, like, this one's around 20, which yeah. you need to. Okay, so. Because you buy, you buy, it pays. Like, yeah, right? Like, you know. like, you're, right? Like, I know Cynthia's laughing. I just see her face laughing. But, right? But, <laughs> this point, too, right? Is if, if there's a, if there's a line that our customers want, yeah. right? Our data will tell us that they will buy more. Yeah. Because we're giving them this price point for half or for six twelve bottles or what I'm trying to think of somebody else. But like so I mean it's it's really about because you right if I want to get 10% more every month, I know I can maybe run some sort of special for this really unique group of customers too, right? To say, right, am I getting this now? I think You're I'm getting, getting this. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm like I, the the light 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 light. Light. Yeah. But right, then they could say, right, I could do these, but I could go through this whole data yeah. because of those people. Right. And yeah. then for the next group, yeah. you would do a whole separate page. A whole separate one. Because yeah. it just gives you the opportunity to build a synthesizing model to, to keep okay. to, you take one question and you work it down. Okay. So we all we all following along here? Yeah, I mean, like, so like for me, like my favorite spot is Total Wine. And for me, they knock that out the box, like the whole customer experience. And I like to go to places like, you know, I shop at the same, same shops and I actually go out of my way because of the customer experience. And so I go to the Total Wine by West Farms Mall and see, I'm a vodka drinker um, and they know that there. And so one day I went in there to buy my boss a, a, a wine and because you know she likes a merlot or something and it's so funny that you know I go in there and I'm in the wine aisle and I'm talking to someone about okay what's a good wine and you know they're asking you your price point and you know of course they go to the hundred dollars like yeah I like my boss but I don't like her that much you know let's kind of go down some but it was funny because one of the staff walked by and he goes you know you're in the wrong aisle right I was like yeah I'm on my way to aisle six the vodka aisle after I finish here so, you know, it, it's that experience because he knows, like, you know, and he just walked by and happened to see me. He's like, um, you know, you're in the wrong aisle, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm on my way back there next. So, but it's like, but like I said, it's the experience and how they do, you know, I don't know if anyone's been in Total Wine, but like, even they have like their, their employees favorite and they have like a little sticker by whatever it is. And, and they give like a description and they talk about the employee and what they like about it. And so, and it's like, oh, the so-and-so employee like this one, let me try this. And, you know, so that's why I love Total Wine for that reason. And also they do free taste testings that, you know, yeah. No, Cynthia, I agree to that point. And it even tying it into all of this, like I was just there on Sunday and they had, they always have like cool things when you first walk in mm -hmm. and I'm that sucker. And yes. You don't know our rosé mix. I don't need it, but it looked great. And they had all these signs described. And I was like, oh, well, I really trust this store. And I yeah. just, like mindlessly, just because it seems like a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, and, and to that point, exactly to that point. So when they look at closed circuit television now, and, in, and these aren't like creepers that are looking at it. These are people that are actually analyzing the footage where they're gonna tell by the number of people that try a sample, they do this at Stop and Shop, they do it at Big Y mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. The number of people that try a sample that actually purchase mm -hmm. is almost 90% at mm -hmm. most retail stores that have free samples. I know Costco's did a study on it, but so they know that if they can get 100 people to try this sample, that 90 of them are gonna buy something. Yeah. So it, it's, it's you know, it's a pretty simple model, but we just drill, we, we think too much about it, you know? But even from the, like, to what Cynthia's saying with, like, <laughs> her love of total wine, which I appreciate, but, like, the customer loyalty aspect from that, that trust piece of it, too. So even if we're that boutique mom and pop shop, mm -hmm. people trust us. So if I'm suddenly putting this new display of wine out front, maybe it's a little pricier, but people are like, oh, my gosh, I love everything they have. This is what they're suggesting. So there's that whole like component of the customer loyalty that might not be like a swipe card or something like that, but also right. just that like trust that you have in a company that blindly purchased the bottle in front of you. Well, okay. No, I think so. There, there is a like a boutique place that I go to in West Hartford to buy booze. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
right in it, but I, and it's little, it's small, and I probably spend a little too much, but it's, you know, family who owns it, whatever. But, but yeah, that's your point. And I had never thought of that, right? Like when I'm there buying my whatever booze, they're, they're always like, well, this is the new one. And their, their social media is probably the best because I probably buy, I go in now to buy whatever they're at because whatever they're making and pairing it with. But I will say this, they always will open a bottle of wine too. So like if you're a little curious, like I'm thinking about you and Total Wine, which is a great place. But that's the insight, right? They're now, oh God, I'm now thinking about all these things that I didn't really know the beginning. <laughs> Jesus, my God. But right, like they're going to open a bottle of wine and I'm going to buy that wine. And then the next time I'm going to remember that wine and then I'm going to buy the other bottle of wine. So yeah. And? And they track it. They do track me. There is no loyalty card. It's by my name. Like it's old school. It's like Augie's when I go get my onion rings, right? Like they know like, oh, this is Hannah Granfield and this is what she, they track it all on their computer. Yeah, it's, it's called upselling. That was like in my first discussion post. Like, I think it, my first job was McDonald's, right? At, I swear to God, I would probably go back to McDonald's. I love that job. But it was always like, they were known for like their burgers and everything else. But we had to upsell, which meant it was like, well, hey, how would you like to try one of our thick, delicious chocolate shakes? And and that's what we, or, you know, or their apple pies. And so we always had to upsell it. And people were like, you know what? Yeah, I'll take an apple pie. And that's like that whole thing. Because again, they're known for their burgers. They're known for their fries. But let me tap you in and, and, and introduce you to, now we have a dessert menu and let's get you to try that. So we had, and that's how they get you with the wine. Well, let me crack open this bottle of wine here, you know, for you. And let me, let me get you to taste it. And you'll be like, oh, I like that. And then you'll buy it and then go buy your other wine. And, and that's how you sold. It's that upsell. And, and like you said, they crack it open and it's like, oh, uh, yeah. I didn't think about this, Eric, until you said it, right? It's, it's, long, it's how long you stay in the store, too, right? They can track me, like, when I come in, or they're seeing our average customer time is, is five minutes, but when we open that bottle of wine, you're staying 20 minutes, right? right? Like, because they're going to have a glass with us, they're going to talk to us, we're going to teach them, and this could go to anywhere. Like, I go to New Balance to get my sneakers, and I'm, I'm in that store for, like, over an hour, and I went in to get a pair of sneakers, right? Okay. Yeah. So okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question related back to the, how do you pronounce it? Because I was not pronouncing it that way. Bader? Bader? Bader, yeah. I just come with that beer. Um, <laughs> but the Bader. So I'm, we're the wine shop. We now have discussed like different ways, like, like Hannah was saying, like for a particular, like even if you're saying like the Merlot or whatever. Do you have multiple Baders rolling at, like it's, it's that one time? Yep. Okay. And now could you also- Don't forget that what we're doing right now is to increase revenue by 10%. So here's my other question to that. So so that's my still my B or whatever the heck. Yep. Can you keep one one B and then go for branch it off that way and try different things at one time? Or you stick if if you're just talking about 10%, you just stick with the one plant. You know so what I mean? It it you can do it, you can do multiple analysis. Yeah. So you keep your base of your B yep. and do multiple analysis, but what you really want to do is you you want to you want you don't want to water down your hypothesis where you want to make sure that you're okay. answering that one specific question. Okay. And it's not like we it, where you can you can tie in a lot of things too. Yeah. Like like the ten percent we we've just now tied in um, human resource costs. We've tied in inventory costs. We've tied in uh, sales revenue. Um, those are three things we picked up in ways in which we can increase that 10%. Technically, we could have a 10%, our 10% growth in sales, boom, and do the ADIR. Okay. Our 10%, our 10% growth in human resource costs and do our temp and do our beta for that. Our 10% cost for um, um, what was our third? Uh, inventory, we had HR. Um, Inventory, HR, and sales. So we could do three different baiters to to basically support. Now, great point, Kate, because if I'm working for Howard Schultz, I'm going to show this person every single way in which this does not make sense. I'm going to do it from an HR cost. And we talked about not having the information as readily, like Cynthia with upselling. Baristas upsell, and for the longest time, they did not have an owner loyalty card at Starbucks. It was just word of mouth. Oh, hey, because you go to the same coffee shop every day, 
it's okay, well, hang on, it's here. Oh, let's get you the um, latte grande, whatever they call it. Um, so that's that right there. They took total, total, I guess, they were on total faith with that, where they just assumed that, that those customers would continue to come back and the baristas would continue to know their order, where they weren't doing anything to capitalize on that relationship. So we, and getting back to our basics, we want to know more than our customer knows. We want to, we want to be able to tell them what they need when they walk through that door. Like that customer sit here that said, vodka's in aisle six, um, or that the employee that said that, um, we want to be able to do that, not only holistically as an organization, but we want to be able to look at the data and say, you need to be here. We tracked your phone, your GPS, you're in aisle five, you need to be in aisle seven, that's where you always purchase something. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna send you a text. Hey, don't, you know, we've got vodka on sale. Uh, um, what's the, uh, Jose Cuerva, is that a vodka? No. Tito, Tito. Tito's, Tito's. Tito's. Yeah. Tito's. Um, so. Uh, what do you drink? I, I drink. <laughs> I drink, I drink Molson Canadian beer. Oh I love this stuff. Um, but, and I drink Sam Adams. That's it. Mm. I don't drink a lot of other stuff. Um, Good to know. So, uh, but anyway, it, yeah, you're going to do these baiters for each component of your goal. And you're going to, you're basically going to put them all together to just strengthen your analysis and are when you make your recommendations. That's probably the most important part we talked about. You're going to present and you're going to um, look at when, you, when you're together with your final and you're going to make recommendations. So, uh, and we, we like to do this as a team exercise because not everybody is super comfortable performing and, and presenting in class while others are more natural at it. And um, so, as a team, you really have to build up your strengths because in the real world, we are going to have to be in a position where we have to rely on a colleague because that's not necessarily our strength. And you build yourself, you build your team around your strengths and weaknesses. By the way, next week, Sandy's going to, I think she's coming in and they're gonna go over the Enneagram again. Um, so you guys can't tell her that I don't, I think it's garbage. Um, <laughs> Sandy, if you're watching this and recording, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to do some um, um, analytics next week uh, for a few minutes. Sandy will be in to talk about that. But um, so our recommendations now for our liquor store, our recommendations are if we increase the amount of time that somebody's in the store, if we uh, incorporate a point of sale loyalty uh, program. <clears throat> and we cut our hours to, we close at nine every night instead of 11. We will make a 10% annual, a 10% monthly increase. Um, so we're really, <clears throat> we can paint the picture for how we need to grow based on that particular data set that we're collecting. Now we could do a whole other data set on um, ways in which we could uh, cut labor costs. Hold on, guys. I got to plug my computer before it dies. So if we look at labor costs, we're focusing on our hours of operation. We're focusing on the uh, number of folks that we have working for us. This is like the great mystery. Find an outlet in this room. Um, so again, I'll be a separate baiter, but you guys are going to move just a hair. Okay. 
Um, again, so if we look at it from an HR perspective, we can break it down. How's the ceiling look? Good? <laughs> I think we're in good shape right there. Um, uh, okay. <clears throat> so again, breaking it down, making our recommendations uh, specific to what we're looking to do. So we can, <clears throat> we can do it any number of things but we have to make that first question part of our strategic goal of growing, sales it, get a good name. So we can do market research on getting a name. Um, we could look at other stores, what they're being called. We could do a, a survey with our customers. We could have a contest, um, but we don't want to do it. <clears throat> Again, the point of the class is to make decisions around a, a secure data collection model, right? Um, so we're not gonna say, let's call it, you know, Emmett's Packy, because I just like the name of it. We're gonna do research. We're gonna figure out, you know, is there another Emmett's Packy in a 65 mile radius? Um, there is an Emmett's Pub in, um, in the um, Back Bay in Boston, in case you're ever out that way, but, um so anyway we want to just we want the whole again the whole point of this exercise or this store is to come up with ways in which we can collect data to solve for that one particular question that's what beta will do and every question we have we throw it through the machine again and we come up with our analysis we select our data <clears throat> we get our insight and we make a recommendation Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? Any questions on that? We baited out for the night? Yeah, I I <laughs> um, how about we go to my next favorite thing, <laughs> which is a SWOT analysis. Uh, who knows what a SWOT analysis is, anybody? Go ahead, Marie, what do you got? It's essentially just an opportunity for companies to look at, or organizations, whatever, to look at um, strengths, with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So just looking at your business as a whole and figuring out where you can grow, grow and what may potentially get in the way of that. Awesome, perfect. Um, <clears throat> This is one, this is a like a proud parent moment. My daughter was, uh, she's a grad assistant up at Bay Path. And um, so they have a new president that came in and my daughter worked in the president's office uh, and the, uh, so the new president has all, all of her kind of underlings and they're doing a SWOT analysis. And they're looking at one of their um, grad programs I'm sorry, one of their doctoral programs uh, and how successful it is. So the, and my daughter is, <clears throat> she's a um, elementary ed um, master's student. So she's not a, um, she's not a data geek like her father. But um, so anyway, <clears throat> man, my daughter was in there taking notes for this meeting. And my daughter was transcribing SWOT analysis. And so the new president, so these program chairs are totally pitching the virtues of their program. Oh, it's awesome. It's this, it's that, it's that, right? So um, their whole, the SWOT is you have your, your S, your strengths above your opportunities. And on the right side, your weaknesses above your threats. So if you're really, truly honest with yourself, you're putting your, you're putting your way more weaknesses and way more threats than you are your strengths and your opportunities. Because every day, well, even with a college, every day there's somebody looking to get your students, every day. So you really can't rest on your laurels. Even if you're a Harvard or a Yale, you just, you can't do it. You really have to be, 
student focused um, and a lot of schools that like your Mount Ida, which you're gonna work on this week, um, they were revenue driven and it didn't end well. So anyway, strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, your threats. So when we're working on our paper that's due next week, we're going to incorporate a SWOT analysis in here. So we're gonna look at from Starbucks perspective, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats. So it's basically a two part analysis, your, your paper, where you're gonna have a little bit of the SWOT, which you're gonna be working a lot with in 650. And then you're gonna work with your um, Bader framework. So, um, and I'm just wondering if I should do, if I should do a SWOT, if we wanna do one now, I can put it up on a board in here. Let me see if we have markers. We'll just do one out before we leave. Oh, here's the test. The dry erase, okay. Oh, I can actually use that board right there. You guys in luck. I found a marker. I'm going to pull the board up so we're kind of we're all going to look at it from the side. Ever watch Show House? Another TV show house. Oh yeah, yeah. That was uh, when he had the um, you know he's wearing the glass. Yeah. The front part. Imagine it was raining. I keep looking over on my phone. It's supposed to be bad. Yeah. Thunder is I, it was supposed to be a storm coming through, but I don't think it's going to be bad. And I'm like, I don't see anything. Like, There's a massive storm up here. I can hear thunder. It's like pouring. Oh, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll make sure we all leave at the peak of the storm. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. The least I could do. For all of your compassion last week with my <laughs> my <laughs> shot. You need to move that closer to them. I don't know. Can you guys see? Uh, can you see the board here? I'm gonna draw a big crosshairs on it. Okay, can you see that? Our viewing audience at home? Okay. Let's go back to our fine wine oh. store. Okay. What would a strength be of our fine wine store? What separates us from the others? First line service. I know, and we're still making them up, right? Personalized service. So yeah. our customer service is better than yes. uh, let's see the customer service. Maybe a unique selection. And we can we can like uh, I'll make the comparison to us as a university versus University of Connecticut. We can make a decision in a day. For them to make a decision, it takes yeah. weeks because um, they have to vet it. It's, it's kind of like when you try to steer a tanker, like if you're, a, if you're a ship, a big tanker ship, you've got to start steering about a half an hour before you actually get to the point where you need to turn. So we can make a, we can offer items that we know from doing a data analysis that our, our customers want, we can unload items that our customers are buying. So our inventory, our selection is much more personalized. So good point. What else? What's another strength of ours? Can you see that okay? Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great location. Great location. The 
receive real estate um, thing. Location, 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 right? And so now he says. Um, okay, so location is a super strength because we we have we like our location. Mm -hmm. um, we have plenty of foot traffic. We know we have enough foot traffic to, to make the amount of revenue that we need to make. So it's now it's a matter of us managing that. So we're not at a dead end street. We're not at the end of a mall somewhere. We're a standalone. So location is something that we definitely want to leverage. Okay. What else? Is this a staff employee? Is that or is that going to make customer service? Probably, probably going to make service. Yeah. I think customer service. No, what's like competitive that? prices? Oh, yeah. Pricing. Rock bottom prices. I take it back. I have drunk wine before. You ever have Mad Dog? Oh, my God. It's not wine. Red wine. It's, it's not. That's like college wine. Mad, it was, it was like in college when I had college it. College wine. No. Moon Star. Moon Star. Yeah, Star. Yeah. College wine. There we go. <laughs> okay, so uh, what separates us? We have great customer service. These are things that our competitors, no matter how much money, the resources they have, they can't beat us. We have a better selection. We have better selection. Do we have the best selection in the world? We have the selection that we know our customers want because we did a beta analysis mm -hmm. on what our customers wanted. Okay. Our location, our competitors can't get that. That's why you see a lot of these big organizations try to buy up the small places, right? They can't compete. And we can set our prices. So we know where our profit margin needs to be. We can set that. Or if you're a big um, corporate store, the, the price comes from above. So they'll sell fewer bottles at more money, and we'll sell more bottles at less money. So we'll make up in quantity, um, and our customers know, we know through our analysis that our customers want this, this, and this. So, um, so these are four strengths that really kind of separate us from our from our competition. Okay. Now, what are some opportunities for us? How can we get better? More product. More product. Okay. So, would more product make us better, or would it? Do we know yet? So think about it. we put more product in the store. We might have more customers come in to buy it, or we could get heavier in inventory. So, so it might not be an opportunity yet until we understand what exactly our customers want. So, like if we know that our customers buy, is it Gabby? Gabby, you think? Is it Gabby? Reward programs. I mean, I think that's an opportunity. Say that again, Cynthia? Reward programs. Reward programs, excellent. Reward programs, I agree. Isn't it a key barefoot idea stand up? Okay. <laughs> that's the only one I know. That's fine. <laughs> uh, or Mad Dog. <laughs> um, You're really dating yourself when you talk about Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> Cynthia, I really, I swear, when I was on that journey with my wife to find that bottle of wine, I saw Mad Dog on the shelf. Oh, yeah. They, yeah, it, it's quite popular back now for some strange reason. You know, back when, when I was, you know, probably a teenager, Mad Dog was probably the most inexpensive. Uh, it is, I think it's considered a wine that you can get. But, yeah, and all different flavors. College. Yeah. College wine. Yeah. <laughs> well, great rewards program. What's another opportunity we have to grow our organization? Could you, so our strength is selection. 
could you get like a really unique bottle of wine or like a specific vintage as an opportunity and have like an event or I mean not an event but maybe just market that out or no? Yeah, we could do that. Are you talking okay. about like having having the barefoot folks set up shop in the front? Like, yeah, and even it's have, like a it's a it's a it's a rare vintage or barefoot like or you know like promotional. Yeah. So we can do so like wine testings okay. or yeah. or wine tastings, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, and at that point too, we can start trying some of the other stuff. And um, then we can increase our inventory. Mm -hmm. So we could we could at that point test out something that um, something that Sal said, hey, you guys should try this. It's good. And we can bring that in without loading up inventory and then in incorporating it into our our inventory when we see the folks like it, uh, wine tasting. It's another opportunity we have. What about, and, and I think this is a big one for me, like any place that I go, and it's it's more so like investing in your employees, and I guess it's more so with the education piece, like them knowing what it is they're selling. Um, you know, when you go in there, and especially when you talk about wines or different alcohols, it, you know, I just don't like some of the mom and pop ones where there's like, oh yeah, a lot of customers come in here and buy this one, but why? Why are they coming in here and buying this one? Uh, what makes this one better than this one over here? Um, or for example, like I'm not a brandy drinker, but um, if I'm having to buy brandy for someone, I, I just don't want someone just to be like, oh, well, this, th this one here is what most everybody comes in and buy, but why? What makes this one unique? Is it about how they do the, the double barrel, whatever aging, is it done on the aisles and all that stuff? You know, even though I'll never get it, you know, or drink it, but it's just, you know, it's it's the why, it's the education piece, and not just, you know, okay, here, try this one. This is, you know, they come in here and buy this one. So I think like educating your employees, I guess, giving them those tools, I guess. I mean, for me, I think that's an opportunity. Oh, I think you make a great point because we talked about it. With we want to keep that boutique mentality. So we want to have, we want to be kind of the go-to experts. Um, and I will date myself, but you ever seen, um, you know, Miracle on 34th Street? Mm -hmm. So do you remember what happened in Miracle on 34th Street? The Santa Claus, the, the real Santa Claus comes in. Spoiler alert, I don't think it's the real one, but so, and telling customers, we don't sell that toy here, but if you go to Kimball's, you can get it over there. We don't sell that toy here, but if you go over here, you can get that. And <clears throat> initially, the guy that owns Macy's is going nuts. He's like, you can't send people to other stores. Why are you doing that? And he's like, well, because they want that product. And if they want that product, we're going to give them something they don't want. They're not going to be happy. They're not going to come back. So, I mean, that's like basic advertising 101. But um, so if we train our employees to, if we offer some type of incentive <clears throat> where we even have like, um, where they can be even to, to continue their education and so forth. But if we invest in our employees, our employees are going to create that atmosphere that we want. We want to have that boutique mentality. Because <clears throat> we know through our research that our customers would prefer to shop in a place where they're not rushed around. They have the, what, exactly what they want. They're going to spend more time in it. And if they're engaging employees in conversations, that typically means what? Two things. One is they're gonna come back. They're gonna come back. Mm -hmm. They're gonna leave with something. Mm -hmm. So, um, remember Cheers. We want to go where everybody knows your name. Um, all right. So we're gonna say like invest in employees. And okay. We don't want to get too cocky. So we got we got our strength, our customer service, second to none, our selection, exactly what the data shows our customers want, our location. We got it. It's ours. It's ours to lose. And our prices. We can control our price point. We can control how much money we make. 
our opportunity is a rewards program to get more into our customer sales because again we want to know more about them than they do um our wine tasting events that are going to bring people in the store it's going to keep them in the store longer okay <clears throat> but we have an incentivizing program to keep our employees engaged if you have engaged employees and marie can tell us this if you have engaged employees you have happy employees happy employees stick around they do a good job um so those are our strengths and our opportunities okay what's a weakness for us based on the data we've pulled and some of the things we've talked about today what's a weakness we only sell wine okay the weakness is we only so if I don't clean the sports night, you're going to think it's like an A. You know? <laughs> Only so wine. Um, now, that's a decision we made. Yep. But if somebody's, let's say I am shopping with my wife and I want to go grab a six pack of Molson, mm -hmm. I can't get it here. I've got to go somewhere else. So I'm going to say, you know what? Let's just go get your barefoot wine over at Big Y. So um, okay, so that's a weakness of ours. We only sell wine. We've decided that's what we want to do, but that's still something that's going to keep us from maybe even having a loyal customer come back if they're looking for something else. Like Cynthia wouldn't go in that store wanting vodka, um, even if we're really nice, because we don't have it. So it's not anything bad. We just chose not to have it. What's another weakness we have? Well, it's also a strength, but the selection because it's smaller. Smaller, yep. Double edged sword. We can't, we've chosen what our customers want, but we might not have the resources to get everything they want. So, if you have an educated sales staff, we can get them to, to shift their selection and try things. So, but by by having being a small boutique shop, we are going to run the risk of losing customers based on the selection. That's certainly a weakness. It's another weakness. I think being a mom and pop shop, there's a lot of benefits, but also you don't have the same type of support that you might if you were part of a larger company. So if you have a couple bad weeks, that could have greatly affect your business as yeah. opposed to being part of something bigger where they could say, all right, well, you know, kick in a little bit more this week or something like that. Kate, and Kate just said like size, and I think that ties into it as well because we don't, we can't, we have to really scramble if we have bad week. Remember we talked about IBM with the weather channel, right? So what if we have two weeks of snow? What if there's a snow like, what if there's like a spring in Maine, Maria, where you've got a foot of snow? Um, people aren't walking down Main Street to go to get their wine. Um, so don't by being uh, we really run on a shoestring budget. So we're at the mercy of the weather, we're at the mercy of the economy, we're at the mercy of the city. The city could come and say, hey, look, um, we're raising property taxes. You know, sorry. So mom and pop, we call it the mom and pop first. Maybe the pandemic for the mom and pop. Mm -hmm. uh, especially no. mass. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, it, the restaurants, they said 60% of the restaurants are closed, aren't opening back up. 60%, so six out of 10 restaurants aren't gonna open back up. Um, but they also have the flexibility, um, like if you, I'm sure you have, right? How many of these places have offered outdoor dining? So people don't have to come and they've tried to maintain certain distancing and so forth, but that's only, you know, they, they, they had to cut staff, they had to cut um, their inventory, so it's trickled down. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, a lot of them that stayed open have run so lean now for the last 14 months that they've also, they're going to be much more efficient now that they survived this. So a little bit of Darwinism here, you know, survival of the fittest, but... Um, a great observation, and uh, I'm going to kind of do a sub with that with our size because um, you know we've got a 1,200 foot shop. We can't compete with a you know 15,000 foot place. Not only in inventory, but those places that sell in volume, they're going to discount it. So 
they might sell a bottle of wine for $14 that we're selling for $16. But they're going to get treated nicer at our place, but um, money only goes so far. What's another weakness that we have? Location, parking. Um... Yep. So we do have a good location for foot traffic. Maybe we have a bad location for parking. The people that drive up have nowhere to go. So they just keep driving the big box. So typically, so we've got five weaknesses right now. We have four strengths, uh, three opportunities. So we're true to ourselves. We want to have more weaknesses and threats. So let's just, um, let's look at our threats right now. Okay, so what is a what is a threat to at something that's out of our control that we really can't? Do? The economy. The economy is a huge threat. And this, no matter what we do, we're reliant on the economy bouncing back, as in, as any industry is. So. Huge share of the economy. What else? Your supply chain. If if you don't have a, um, a a good supply chain, that that's a huge threat. You know, someone who's always going to have issues getting you inventory, where they're keeping you out of stock. And if you're out of stock, you can't sell. And if you can't sell, you can't make money. Excellent point. We have supply chain, and we have big box stores that are going to undercut us every day. That's what they like to do. Honest, even smaller mom and pop that offer more than just one. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Packies that sell everything, that sell the liquor, that sell the beer, or just a wine shop. We cater to the high end winos. Oh, Raina. Oh, Delivery. I think I feel that's a threat. Like, you know, you if you don't have now you have you can buy it online or you can order um if, if you don't have the option to have it delivered to you. Oh like, or, I love drizzly during the beginning days oh, of the pandemic. I thought you were saying it's drizzling. No, I'm drizzling. Selling. What's that? Drizzly, do you know drizzly's the app? No. Yeah. Hey, you can order your booze online and it connects you to a local liquor store that just shows up an hour later. Yeah, or I think Instacart does it now, don't they? Where they they'll go buy your alcohol, they'll do your alcohol for you too. Really? That's another app. That's another app. Hannah freely gives her data too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know what's funny though? I did in the beginning because right nobody was going anywhere, right? And so I was or I'm not lying, I was ordering it for my house and my parents. And then. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Up, I didn't go anywhere, and I would get Drizzly like tech, like texts and emails, and I would like, I sign up this. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could that also be an opportunity yeah. for us though to look there you go because the second you said it Cynthia I was like yeah that's actually a great I mean depending on the manpower could we also offer mm -hmm. at yeah. least delivery maybe not online but or partner with like you said Grizzly or Instacart or somewhere to give that where you're able to partner with them for them to do delivery which you know uh, to that, where I, I do think it's an opportunity for us to look at, but we also have to look at if a third party does it, there's a liability piece that we're, we're, we're removed from. If we if we if we've got our delivery person, you know, and drops off booze at a kegger and somebody wraps, a, you know, their dad's Lexus around a telephone pole, then we're liable because we provided that. So uh, having a third party do it. Great. Um, but I do think it's an opportunity if we have, if we know who our customers are. Like if we know based on our research that our customers want that, you know, that, you know, Hannah buys a case of Barefoot on the third Thursday of every month, right? Uh, and a case is only six bottles of wine, right? So yeah. some bottles yeah. sizes usually. Yeah. So I'm not implying that Hannah drinks a lot. I'm just saying like if that's her pattern, yeah. right? Um, so, but we can get it to a we can we can offer that to our customers and create an online 
portal for our customers. So and it's the boutique. We want to get them in the store, but but providing if we do have a formal location for parking, then it would make sense to come up with a delivery model for them. So it is also an opportunity. Good point, Maria. What about holidays? You know, um, would that not be like an opportunity? So like, you know, um, like I said, so again, like with, you know, it's tequila day, right? And, you know, there was nothing worse for me during tequila day. I go to a liquor store and they have no tequila. It's tequila day. Or even buying like the gift sets and, and implementing, because, you know, I, I think like for holidays and the Christmas and like definitely Christmas, like the sales boost up because everybody always go and get like the little cute little canister sets or gift sets that come with the glasses and the bottles and the, you know, would that not be like an opportunity to look into investing more into like the holiday gift sets or anything like that? I think it would be an opportunity because we can, so if we look at it from collecting the data, we know what our customers want. We have that rewards program. We know, that, you know, what they, what they buy, when they buy and so forth. We can make those recommendations like, you know, based on your purchases, here's, here's a 10% off coupon for any uh, type of kit that you buy, like a, not a kit, but like a package. If you've got like uh, a couple of bottles of wine and a blanket, stuff like that. So I think certainly that's an opportunity that the, the, the difference being is like the big boxes can certainly undercut us from a price perspective, but it gives us point of sale uh, and uh, impulse purchasing mm -hmm. as well at our boutique shop. So, and that also comes in with the wine tasting too, where we might have, we might use the wine tasting as a way in which to have, um, we might have it around Christmas. So when, I mean, I know we've all been there, but try to be at the mall like on the 23rd and you got four or five people on your list and you're like, you know what? You're getting booze. And you just mm -hmm. go to a liquor store and you buy a couple of bottles and you know, so I think it's an certainly an opportunity if we have loyal customers that we can kind of, uh, you know, maybe uh, exploit um, to, to, to get them into like the gift, the gift buying mode. Um, but we're not soliciting their, their, um, you know, their friends and family, so to speak, but we're certainly looking at them to provide them a solution for some um, shopping. So I think, I think that's a good opportunity. Sir, can I just a big quick question? So would you typically do a beta and this or one or the other? So I would typically do both. Okay. Because we can, we're looking at this as a means in which we need to get 10% annual, a 10% yeah. monthly growth. We know that's what it's gonna, it's gonna take for us to pay our mortgage. We know that's what it's going to take for us to be successful. So we know we can grow our, our organization 10% every month. Uh -huh. So this particular beta is looking at our store as a whole yeah. and ways in which we can increase that revenue by 10% monthly. Okay. So, and of that, so our, our, we look at our strengths and our opportunities and we kind of wince and we look at our weaknesses and threats mm -hmm. as immediate things that immediately could affect that 10% that increase. We know the economy tanking, but we're off 10% immediately. You know, big box could open up down the street tomorrow, we're done. Uh, well, our supply chain could say, sorry, there was a fire in Napa Valley, mm -hmm. this okay. isn't available. Um, we know a packy could start selling wine cheaper just to get people in the door, but we don't have the ability to sell anything else but wine yet. We know that Amazon or Drizzly can put it right on your doorstep the next day. We don't. So that's those are all things that could affect our 10% right now. Um, who's been in sorry. No, no, I can do it. Um, and again, we only sell wine, we're good with that. Okay. Um, we have not as big a selection, we're okay with that. For a mom and pop, we prefer that. Um, our size, we can't compete with the big box, but we're okay, we can manage that right now. And we don't have the best place, we don't have the best parking, 
And again, it's nothing that's going to hamstring us. We're, it's just a weakness. So if we can counter our weaknesses by looking at all of the data we can get, we can't make any of these decisions if we don't know our customers. If we don't know our customers, then we, we have uh, probably three times the size of our weaknesses and threats because we're guessing at that point. Um, but I typically do both. I have to say, I, I'll do the beta and then I'll do the okay. swap Thank because you. it will give me the opportunity that, like, if I really was stretching, like, if I really wanted to, um, and I have in my conviction all the data that I collected and I'm really mm -hmm. comfortable with it, then um, I would know. I would probably have one or two strengths, one or two weaknesses, I mean, one or two opportunities, and the rest being weaknesses and threats. Okay. Because we know that those are more out of our control than our strengths mm -hmm. and our opportunities are right now. We make our own opportunities, we built our strengths, we can build more strengths, but we can't really control um, threats and weaknesses unless we build our own defense up. So like to, if, if you use a sports metaphor, you ever hear um, teams complain because they're running the score up and they're mm -hmm. like, well, they should just sit their starters. It's like, no, mm -hmm. it's not our job to prevent you from scoring. It's our, it's, our, it's our job to prevent you from scoring, not our job to basically <laughs> not you know hurt your feelings. Well, in, in industry like this, um, I don't think a big box would have a problem putting a mom and pop out of business. They, they do it daily, uh, unfortunately. So those are things that we really can't control. We have to build up a, a loyal customer base to do that. And to do that, we have to collect <coughs> a boatload of pertinent data that we feel is going to help us make the decisions that we need to make. So we don't worry about what, you know, the Drizzly app soon. We don't worry about what East Packy's doing down the street. We worry about the data that we know is our customer. And our customer is the one that provides us with all of our revenue. Um, so anyway, it's it is a lot to take in, but I'm telling you, this is kind of like a kind of a prelude to 650 because we're gonna do some more data strategy in the form of a SWOT analysis. So I like the spot better than the beta, but that's maybe just because I'm visual right now. We could have done the beta on the yeah, beta, right? and that's probably what I will do at home. Just map it all out. But. Because you you really just want to question yourself. That's yeah. all you're doing with beta. You're just questioning yourself. You come up with your question based on your goal and prepare it for it. If at the end of the day it comes out that you support your hypothesis, good job. Move on to the next one. If not, scrap it, start over. So it's only a five-step program. So it's not like we're spending three hours on each particular yeah. piece. So I don't know. What do you guys think? You guys you grabbing it? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a weak agreement. Like, not even a head nod. Come on. <laughs> um I can't. So as we're working, you're looking at this week's paper coming there. I'm sorry, paper due on the eighth, right? Um, you're going to want to incorporate a SWOT analysis. So I would strongly recommend you do your paper an academic writer so you can insert a graph. Um, it's a lot easier than trying to drop an X and Y axis in there and start, you know, freelancing. Uh, or uh, is it freehand your um, your different categories here? So use a use academic writer, drop a graph in. Um, keep your weaknesses and uh, threats. Uh, well, I'm not. It's you'll find there are more weaknesses and threats. So and strengths and opportunities. It's, it, it's just going to come holistically to you from the reading. Um, and again, that's your paper that you're probably going to submit with your portfolio. So just keep that in mind. No pressure there. No pressure. Really, there isn't. You got a couple weeks to knock it off. And 
it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to help you. It's going to help kind of get a little bit closer to the forest at the end of the trees. So it's still going to be looking straight into a big redwood, but you, you'll be able to see some light around it as to why this stuff makes sense and how as a rookie three weeks into a data program, you could have saved Starbucks a lot of, <laughs> a lot of money by your input. So any other questions for tonight? We got our we got our discussion board next week. Only one reply. I updated the um, the rubric in the um, in in the uh, discussion board question. So it's one reply. Um, you don't need citations in there. And you got your um, paper that I need to the. We must be done because Hannah's packing up. I'm so. sorry. I just realized it was the out. Everybody's got an umbrella? No. I parked a mile away, too. Yeah. Hannah's on her way to Total Wine right now. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I'm not going to lie. I drink this afternoon at lunch, so it's been a long day. We got well, like, If I know a storm is coming or if it's snowing, I'm not getting milk and bread. I'm getting alcohol. I'm stuck in the house with my kids for days. <laughs> all right so listen we'll see you guys next wednesday um not really just get my charger have a uh have a an enjoyable long weekend if you're off uh but other than that text me email me if you have any questions or if you need anything all right thank you bye, bye. have a good night bye. guys good have night. a good everybody Good night. I do have one question for the paper.